sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery. Almighty God, forbid it! I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty, liberty. or give me death. death. Excellent. <laughs> we are going to look briefly for the next few moments at the Southern campaigns, some myths and some facts to get you thinking. But a good friend of mine on the way down, I think he's a friend, said, uh, you know, you got to change some of your material, so I'm going to add some new elements in to get us thinking. And um, what one thing that is uh, very exciting is I still get nervous, real nervous, when you're in front of revolutionary scholars or revolutionary doers like George and Carol, uh, who do things. And um, I remember growing up in a big family, I was the sixth of nine kids, and I get nervous when I open my law office 20 some years ago. And um, a person walks into my office, you know, and hires me, and I call my brother who's a doctor, and I say, John, somebody walked into my office, told me their problems, and paid me for my advice. <laughs> and being a doctor, he goes, David, that's great. And an older brother, he says, but in my business, medicine, people walk into my office, tell me their problems, take off all their clothes and pay me for my advice. <laughs> <laughs> As George knows, I'm gonna jump around a little, but we're gonna use the elements from the word liberty, you know, to, to jog your memory, so that's a cue. Well, the first myth is that after the 1776 victory at Charlestown of the Patriots over the British Navy, right, and William Danger uh, Thompson's action up on Sutler's, uh, Sullivan's Island on the northern side, that, that South Carolina didn't have anything to do with the Declaration of Independence, right? We go from 1776 to 1780 when that next siege occurs. Well, did you know that there is a town in South Carolina, and only two towns are mentioned, cities, if you will, in the Declaration of Independence. Now I know most people don't read it anymore, or if they've ever read it, maybe in this room, but you gotta look deeply. So inside the Declaration of Independence, it says in a line, they use the word he, they conveniently changed it, they were really talking about the parliament and in addition to the king, he said that he, being the king, has called together legislative bodies for the um, at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from their depositories of the public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them, fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. Now I'm gonna pass this around in case you think I'm making that up. So, oh, oh, you want the name of the town. So one was a Yankee town in Massachusetts, and one is a South Carolina town. And by the way, the fatiguing was a lot greater in South Carolina. Can anybody name the town? Liberty. Liberty. No, the town. Liberty. Liberty. No, no, didn't exist back then. The town. Liberty. Town B. 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 Buford. Buford is 80 miles from Charlestown. And six or seven years before, Governor Montague said, Hey, I dissolve you, but you better be tomorrow in a quorum, or uh, within two days, 80 miles away. Now, up in Massachusetts, they called it the same thing, but it was Boston to Cambridge. It's only about 12 miles. In fact, today, Cambridge is part of Boston, but 12 miles versus 80. Well, for the first time ever in colonial history, the next day in Buford from Charlestown, we had the largest quorum of legislative bodies in colonial history to show the king how South Carolina responds to his attempt to fatigue us. So then you take away and you look at, gosh, there were signers from South Carolina of that document, and there were 56 signers eventually who signed the Declaration of Independence. And um, you think, well, did any of them fight? I know they sacrificed some things, and there were they put you know a, a bounty on some people's heads, and, and they were all in danger. In fact, so scared that they didn't sign it. Only two people signed it: President John Hancock and the Secretary. Um, and so, but we did have two guys. In fact, we had the youngest signer, right? And that was the brother of the President of South Carolina, what would become South Carolina, and that was Edward Rutledge. 
So go with me out of Buford from naming it in the declaration to a couple years later in that whole era, remember one of the second myth is that we beat the British in 76 and then they beat us in 80 and nothing happens in between. Well, we all know we were, we're gonna learn that there are major attacks from the British out of Savannah and Florida and Georgia through to take Charlestown in 78 and in 79. And one of them is, it takes place on an island, which we think of as vacationing now, but outside of that town of Buford, which was on Port Royal Island. And when General Augustin Prevo was launching his 79 attack, 1779, to take Charleston, he need, Charlestown, he needed some uh, waylay stations, and one of them would be Buford. So he puts a Colonel Gardner on it, he said, lands troops, uh, regular troops from New York before, and some Southerners, to um, take the, te the island of Port Royal Island. And Moultrie is given command to go down there with about 300, he can only wield about 325 people. After all, they're coming out of Charleston, Charlestown, and as we all know today, that's the center of South Carolina universe. But he said, <laughs> 80, 80 miles south, and in that group is 29-year-old Edward Rutledge and 32-year-old Thomas Hayward, Jr. And they are man, uh, each manning and commanding two artillery units from Charlestown, one with two six-pounder cannon and one with two, two uh, three-pounder cannon, or what would later be called the grasshopper. What's interesting about this battle, which we come to know it at Buford, called the Battle of Port Royal, they're out in the field, and, and it's the opposite myth. Remember the British line up in the field and the, and the Americans hit them and run into the woods. Well, in this case, Gardner's men are lined up in the woods and they run out and run back into the woods. And Moultrie's militia of 320 people with a few officers of Continental and these two artillery units are lined up with Edward Rutledge and um, Thomas Hayward in the middle of the road. And they fire. And this battle goes on for 40 to 50 minutes which makes it twice as long as one of our famous battles up at Camden, Hopkirk Hill. And of course, it's the opposite, right, Moultrie? We're in the open field, we're in line, and the myth that the regulars always beat the militia and the militia are no good, Moultrie whips their tail. And it takes place about three miles south of the ferry as you go on to Port Royal Island. And uh, it's right where the uh, Marine Corps Air Base is today. And it's an exciting battle that shows that South Carolina Southerners, uh, from the very beginning, are involved with military actions and, and they're willing to put their lives where their words are, okay, with it. Now, I want to stay on the B for a minute uh, to move to another battle, and I, I know George is saying, was well, he going to work in Francis Marion? But there came a place down in an area called the Black Mingo. It's a wonderful hunting area today. Uh, and there was a big inland town that rivaled Camden at the time. Camden had 21 homes. This had at least 18 structures called Willtown. But they called it the Black Mingo area. And in Black Mingo, um, there would be this actions where first Carlton goes through the area and he's striking terror into the inhabitants. And then later, James Weems, Colonel Weems, the British uh, colonel is ordered to go, or Major is ordered to go in and un, uh, do, do what Tarleton didn't finish doing. But I came across two guys who grew up and lived in, uh, in uh, Black Mingo in the little town of Willtown, and they were Captain John James on the Patriot side and Captain Brockington on the, on the, um, on the uh, Tory side or the Loyalist side. And they lived and they grew up together. And they would fight on this field around the battlefield, which started at a tavern run by a guy named Dollards, who uh, you know catered to both sides like any good businessman would. And uh, but I want to take you back just a little bit further because we always think battles in the Southern campaign. <coughs> We've all heard of a guy named George Woodmason, right? Yeah. Who would uh, rise up and out of necessity become an itinerant preacher? Well, George Woodmason settled originally in South Carolina in Willtown in Black Mingo. He was also an, uh, an inventor. And he came up with this idea 15 years before that how do I cross the Black Mingo with regular mercantile business? So he develops, we would call it today a floating dock. He called it a floating bridge. It was a bridge with ropes, but at some point there were hatches. Not lifters, but hatches. 
So I think of a floating dock like you see on the Watery or up at Lake Watery or Lake Santee or Marion or Murray. And he came up with this idea. Some people think, there's one historian, that part of that floating dock is the rickety bridge that Francis Marion would come out of the upskirts up north of Black Mingo and use to attack on September 28th of 1780. But in that battlefield, remember, is Black Mingo inhabitant James on the Patriot side and Brockington on the Tory side, and they'll meet and they'll fight. And of course, um, the uh, Patriots are able to take the town back at least for a while in Willtown, but later the Willtown will, will be, uh, a lot of it will be attacked again by the British later on in the war. But after the war, uh, dealing with how people get over the sides that they're on, a lesson we could probably learn today from our partisanship, um, a guy stands up and gets 80 people of the town of Willtown to sign a petition willing to forget and forgive the injuries done, I'm quoting, by those who rendered themselves obnoxious to the common wealth of South Carolina. And of course, who they were talking about was Brockington. Well, Brockington accepted it, continued to live there in, in uh, Black Mingo area, uh, not as wealthy as he was before, but he was also a reenactor. So he took his grandkids, pulled out his revolutionary British uniforms, which would have been provincial, put his grandkids in them, and paraded down the street whenever James or any of his relatives were in the town. And so there was this back and forth so that he could enjoy the anger created by the old Whig whenever he, he as, a, uh, as a Tory was dressed in that. So see, reenacting as a starting point even earlier. So that is a victory battle of Francis Marion of some sort. Uh, related to Black Mingo. Now I'm going to jump around a little. This is one that, that you know, women really don't have anything to do with anything. The ladies, right? Oh, they're, they're camp followers or they're laundresses or they're wagon masters, maybe. But I want us to learn how to take that myth away, take off the Victorian age, which is what occurred between when people wrote before the, the, that other war and what happened until the 1900s, and go back. They were spies. They were active combatants in many cases, not as many, but here's the big myth. Blows my mind when I learned this, couldn't believe it. The British sent over thousands of wives to be with their junior officers. A good friend of ours named John Reese up in New York has done uh, analysis, like a spreadsheet analysis of this, and in the regiments which all came from New York to fight in the South, not necessarily with all their women, but they were over here in this country. They had 10% of the regimental force of like 3,000 would be women, uh, would be 12% would be women, and 10% would be their their children that they brought. Not children they had here, children they brought over from England. So they solved one problem that we're still dealing with in current issues. So that's a myth with a fact that we can learn about. And then there's different ratios and rations. And it probably is also true in the Southern campaigns that not as many of those women also came down here, but the, clearly there were plenty of them that did that. Now, let me jump to one of my favorites, the E. A big battle, the major battle, outside of that huge defeat at the Battle of Camden back in 1780. Go fast forward quite a few months into the September of 1781. And of course, it's a battle that was a, uh, was, took place not far from here called Utah Springs. And Marion plays a big role in it. Light Horse Harry Lee plays a role in it. Everybody but a guy named Sumter plays a role in <laughs> The myth, it was a patriot defeat. Total myth fabricated by British authors in the early, in the, about 1830 is when it started. I have looked at a map of the United States in the uh, archives of the Maryland uh, Law Judiciary Library. It's as big as half this room, this section of the room, the map you have to unfold it. And one of the major locations on the map, as if it was almost as big as Charlestown, it's not representing size, it's representing, is Utah Springs. Because for 40 years, everyone knew on September 8th, 1781, when Nathaniel Green took 2100, 2200, uh, to Lieutenant Colonel Stewart's 1,600 uh, active participants and beat the pants off of them in a five-hour battle that was a major victory of the Patriot cause. Now, 
If you don't believe me, you've got to take a tour with me at the Battle of Utah Springs. But that's the biggest myth, that we didn't win it. We did win it. Of the six gold medals ever given by Congress during the eight and a half years of the American Revolution warfare conflict, Green got one of the gold medals for his victory at Utah Springs. And so that, that takes, takes that part of it right there. Now, I want to jump for a minute to uh, go back to the ladies because they do play significant roles beyond what we think, including the younger women. And um, in Everett Ellett's book, Elizabeth Ellett's book, published in the 1840s, and by the way, there were four books, three other authors between 1820 and 1850, did major biographical work on the basis of women in the revolution and their active role. 18 of the 120 named in our original three, uh, three volumes are from South Carolina. Now, Francis Marion knew Rebecca Mott. We, we get that from the battlefield at Mott's. And we've all heard of uh, maybe uh, Mrs. Bratton up at Brattonsville and Huck's defeat. But sometimes the younger women play a key role, too, that, that uh, is, is not, not worth just glossing over. And one of them, of course, is um, Emily Geiger, who's probably only 14 and a half years old. Am I saying it right? I will still get, or is it Geiger? Geiger. 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 Help. Geiger. Geiger. So Emily is only 14 and 15, and she is intercepted by a Brit a colonel named Greg as she's delivering message, messages between Thomas Sumter and, um, and Nathaniel Green. But then you go into the upstate. I mean, these are women whose names we, we should ring with off our tongue, and we don't. They're real heroines to teach our children. And one of them is uh, Dicey Langston, from way up in what uh, I would call the dark corner of South Carolina. I've always wanted to date somebody named Dicey Langston. <laughs> <laughs> she was involved in the bloody scout maneuver. That part of it involved. She's only 15 years old. And at one point, one of the company, uh, um, get, what's below a sergeant or equal to a sergeant, Steve? Corporal. Corporal would uh, put a gun to her father's um, head, and she threw her body like a neck around him and hugged him and everything like this. And then she turned fully around <laughs> and said, if you must shoot a, a, a patriot, then shoot through my chest. And um, that, that you know, certainly was passed down in the family. But these are real women. She went on to marry a guy named Thomas Springfield and was active and lived in Greenville, what would become Greenville, early on for a long time. Now, just because we, we think they don't play a role doesn't mean they didn't, which leads me to the T, the myth about how we obtain historic truth, okay? And I, I want to point out one of my favorite things. You must look at three parts. Steve Smith was here today. You've got to look at archaeology. You've got to walk the land, as George knows so well in his stories. And you also have to do archival. Archival is all that research that Dick Watkins spends thousands of hours in, in repositories that are unusual, uncomfortable, and et cetera, right? Dick? So no matter, they go to the cause. But we can't overlook, especially in today's internet world where we're networked, into genealogy. Because in these genealogy manuals on people's families, there are nuggets called anecdotes. And those anecdotes have truth. Some of them might be stretched to a legend, but some of them can be boiled down to a nugget of truth. They don't want to know about the revolution, they just want to know about their family. But if we don't look at archaeology, if we don't look at, at uh, archival, I wouldn't want to do what Dick does, but I'm sure glad Dick does it and Mr. Sealy and all that. Because then I can take it and walk the ground. But you also have to look at anecdotal. And without those three, it is like a stool that doesn't stand up. You need all three for the truth um, in order to get it from a history point of view. Now, one that I, let me go to the eye for a minute. You know, all Southerners are just into slavery. And to jump back to the, uh, to the, to the um, declaration, we have a myth because we've all seen it in, you know, it was Edward Rutledge in the movie 1776 of the play. They even did it again in the John, wonderful John Adams series. And Edward Rutledge is a little 26-year-old who fought at Buford at Port Royal a couple years later. And he says, you know, oh, I'm going to take that slavery clause out, the anti-slavery clause. Well, do you know that that's the myth of popular culture? Because they pick on Edward Rutledge. Remember, his brother is the president of South Carolina, John Rutledge. 
Edward Rutledge never, there's no writing whatsoever that he opposed that anti-slavery provision in the, in the weeks of the Declaration's negotiation. None. Now, did he own slaves? Yes. And did he believe in slavery? Yes. But he wasn't the guy who stood up and said, you must take that out as such. Now, did he vote that way? But remember, all those proceedings are, are somewhat secret still to this day. But let me pick two other famous South Carolinians who break that myth of slavery. One is Henry, Henry Lawrence, who would, uh, of course, who's born, uh, excuse me, whose plantation, his favorite place on the Cooper was the uh, property right next to where Francis Marion was born, down there, and at what we call today Memkin uh, Abbey. And uh, he had a huge place. In fact, he, even if you walk the grounds and you go to his grave, you'll also see where he put in some ships uh, into this, his own port on Build of Earth instead of the wood where he may or may not have avoided certain duties and taxes that he would have gotten if he had stopped in Charleston. And then next to him is his son, John Lawrence. Now John Lawrence, of course, as most of you know, will be one of George Washington's official army, they all call them sort of green, families. You know, the guys who do all the, uh, the Scott, or the Dick Watkins work around George Washington. And um, he's, he's a youngster and in his 20s, and uh, let me pass those around. Green is, um, I mean, uh, Washington is using people from every state in order to have that political net connection. Well, John Lawrence, son of the second richest man in South Carolina, says, I'm willing to give up my entire inheritance. I never had this happen in my law office. <laughs> my entire inheritance, if you'll allow me to take my entire inheritance, cash it out, and arm black troops. Just, by the way, like the British are doing. Some of, the Hessian, most, some of the major Hessian troops that were black came from South Carolina. So he says, Dad, let's do this. And of course, Henry, by this point, who has been not only a wealthy uh, you know, member of society, he's also been president of the United States. Yeah, one of those before George Washington for 13 years, who fought the war and made treaties and made peace and, and did things for 13 years while we were part of the, while we were born on July 4th, right? 1776. And so he is connected, but he's saying, son, John, slow down. Slow down. Now the beauty of this story, which I don't think has been told much, we know it here in South Carolina, but not as well elsewhere, is you got the generational thing. He's saying, son, someday there'll be, I'll free my slaves. Someday you will. But do you really want to give up all that money? You know? And John is saying, who, by the way, he sent him to England to learn. So he's progressive, more progressive than his father. He says yes. And of course his father turns him down and he enjoys his slaves as well. But then there's another myth that comes up with the John and Henry Lawrence family. We all know the war ended at Yorktown. Boulder Dash. We must start teaching people that, not the word. But there was no way the revolution ended. Now if you don't believe me, I want to show you a couple examples. John Lawrence will fight 15 months after Yorktown and die on a battlefield in the Low Country. John Lawrence, you know, officer at George Washington's immediate headquarters family. So tell Henry Lawrence, who lost his son, that that happened. But let me pick a better source. General Nathaniel Green, right? The number two guy in the entire war, the number one guy in South Carolina. In February and March, which if I get this right, is five or six months after your town, he says, to the secretary at war, who happened to be Benjamin Lincoln. Oh, don't you love that they call people what they really were back then, secretary at war? You can have little idea of the confusion and disorder which prevails in South Carolina. The scenes change so fast and the operation of law so feeble that it is almost impossible to conduct any kind of business. Our difficulties are so numerous and our wants so pressing that I have not one moment's relief from these most painful anxieties. Nathaniel Green, 1782. Of course, it could also be George uh, preparing for this conference. Um, <laughs> another one, uh, three weeks later. The northern states ought to do more than they do. Their repose affords them an opportunity. If, listen to this, if every state is at liberty to act like playing at cross purposes, those at ease up there can never be brought to give full aid to those in distress down here. I wish to see some plan adopted for compelling the delinquent states
to do a full discharge of their duty. Until this takes place, I have little hopes of ever seeing get this, civil or military government. The war is still going on. And finally, he says, if the states do not levy taxes, I see not how the war can be supported. March, not 1782. And it'll still be three quarters of a year until the British, until the British leave. No other source than Nathaniel Green writing to the highest. So let me go uh, for a few more minutes back to the I. So we got ladies, we got truth, we've got um, Utah Springs, we've got Buford and Black Mingo. This is a powerful one that I that I don't know why I, I find it that way, but you know, just like Woodmason created the bridge or uh, Edward Rutledge signed the Declaration of Independence, there's more than what's happening on the battlefield, though the battlefield is driving things. So at this Battle of Camden, which we call Gum Swamp up there, takes place about six, seven or eight miles north of the town, there is a huge battle in August, which you know, when Cornwallis moves up there to attack um, Horatio Gates and the Continental. So his 2,400 men face Gates is 4,500 on that battlefield. And on that battlefield, as Charles likes to mention when he gives a wonderful tour, you've never seen the Battle of, of Camden until he, he's doing it with Charles. He said, um, there is the whole uh, uh, eastern side of the Patriot Line, and uh, it's where the North Carolina militia collapses, even though the Maryland Continentals are on the right. And part of those three North Carolina militia men are three guys. And here's their names and why they're important. Uh, just seven years later, they will be involved in the, continent, in the uh, convention to create the Constitution. Not the first constitution, the third one. Yeah, remember we had articles, another myth. We had articles of association that operated from 1777 to 1781. Articles of confederation, which came in, were finally ratified in 1781. And then the US Constitution was created in 1787 to take place. On that battlefield at Camden, not far from my office, there's a 21-year-old named uh, Richard Dobbs Spate. And Richard, I'm sorry, Richard Spate Dobbs. And Richard Spate Dobbs' family has a fort north of Charlotte, still there, uh, the site from the French and Indian War. And he is uh, fighting there, running there with the rest of the North Carolinians. He'll go on to be the governor, and he'll move the state capital to Raleigh of North Carolina. So no, not a little individual. Then there's a guy in his 30s named William Blount. And William Blount will fight there, too, in his 30s on the battlefield, at least for a little while that the North Carolinians were fighting. And he'll say, um, he'll go on and he'll do an area called Transylvania, which we just doesn't work in America. And, um, and then it was Kentucky. And he creates also a place called Tennessee. I'm not doing it with that Indian accent. We should. And he founds and settles the town of Knoxville after his friend, General Knox. And his house is still there, this guy who fought at the Battle of Camden. He'll be on, go on to become a U.S. Senator, and it, the, uh, he'll be the first person before the American Civil War to be impeached from the federal government. <laughs> because he comes up with an idea, not the Northwest, but the old Southwest, Pensacola, Louisiana, and all that stuff to the Southwest, to take it out and create my own country, and I'll be president. <laughs> William Black. <laughs> <laughs> then there's a 42-year-old professor of mathematics fighting on the same battlefield, who by this time went to the University of Pennsylvania, but which had one of the few great medical schools in this country. He also attended graduate medical school in Edinburgh, Scotland. Comes back and he teaches himself math, uh, math and medicine. And he's on that field. He is the guy who mentioned the quote that Carl Borg said earlier today, that, you, that after the Battle of Camden, you're not giving us the Patriots side enough supplies. So when they say, well, we're taking everybody down, he says, oh, take me, take me. So he goes over and offers himself as a prisoner of war. And then he puts out a smallpox epidemic in Charlestown for both sides. So you wonder, gosh, if he hadn't been that good to them, maybe things would be different. <laughs> so then he goes on to the convention. And he, you know, he goes on to his work. And he's a mathematician. And this is the part that blew me away. Fought in the battle camp. At that, at that convention, the Yankees say, well, you know, another myth, you know, black people are black people. They're real people, but they don't. Yeah, they don't count. We don't count them as numbers. And the Southerners say, they're not people, 
but by God, every one of them counts. counts. And in the middle of that big debate, the first person to rise up was 40, well, now he's 49 years old, or 50 at the time, is um, Hugh Williamson, mathematician. Mathematician, precise, they count three-fifths. And the three-fifths compromise was written into the Constitution and will exist till 1865 when Lincoln gets through the 13th Amendment and Congress, the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery. See how powerful it is? And by the way, these are guys who put their lives and do things, not just talk about things, like Carol and, and George do. You know, they're doers, and they're willing to put their lives on. All right, now I want to jump, uh, and th there's a lot there. I want to mention two more. We are in a crisis in this country related to religion. The myth is religion has no place in the public square. And since it's that way today, it should have always been that way. Well, I don't want to bore you with too many quotes, but I wrote down quotes, sentences from different founders. And I want to read a couple of them. Religion is the natural and as organic as the family element in society. Religious integrity and freedom are as near to an individual as any power of government. These are all by different founders. Government is the creature and not the creator of a man's right. Government is the servant, not the master of our private relations and our religious consciences. Government, government cannot legislate or adjudicate questions of religious duty or the validity of our conscience. However, Government can, can inquire into whether a claim of religion is sincere, and it can always yield that claim to another sincere claim, like any claim of religion that threatens public order or public peace. These are the signs. So the myth is no religion in the public square, when in fact the truth from the revolution, of which South Carolinians participated, was that no religion is above another. No religion isn't above another. And that it is, um, we won't have an, un, an unnecessary entanglement of religion. And the big one that South Carolinians pushed for the most, that we're not going to pay for somebody's particular religion anymore. And to point this out, and I'm coming to the end, to point this out, in 1775, when people were still for five more years making up their mind to be patriot or loyalists, or switching signs, depending on who was in your neighborhood. The Sa Committee of Safety, I love that, they just call it the Committee of Safety, you know, like the Committee of the Marian Conference. And they just send people into the back country. And it starts with a little 20-some-year-old, and it starts all the way up to a 71-year-old. But here's the power of their thinking. We know it as the Drayton Tenant Mission. In, in the fall of 1775, William Drayton and William Tennant. And this is the rich William Drayton. By the way, he's in his early 30s. And Tennant's in his late 40s. But they also picked a Baptist, Oliver Hart. Well, Drayton is an Anglican. Tennant is a Presbyterian, going into deep Presbyterian backcountry. Oliver Hart is a firebrand who taught Richard Furman everything he knows. And he's in his 50s. He's a Baptist. And then they pick up 71-year-old Richard Richardson from down here, who, of course, will lead the campaigns later that same few months. Gosh, I hope I'm that active in my 70s. And then they pick up Joseph Kershaw, our county's namesake. And the, uh, by the way, Joseph Kershaw would today be called a universalist. He gave money and land in Camden to Jews, Presbyterians, Anglicans, and Quakers. You can see it in the deeds. They're over in Columbia. So he would be called a universalist. The theory was, if we want to create liberty in this world based on liberty beliefs in the next, we don't want it to be anybody's particular religious liberty belief, and that it's for all encompassing. Wow, what, does anybody got us beat on that story in any of those other colonies up north related to religion? And I think not. I think not. But now I draw to a deeper concern. So we look at we look at archaeology under finding the truth. We look at anecdotes. We look at archival information. Religion plays a role. There are many battlefields which we've gotten written upside down or backwards. Um, then we've got battlefields that we know about, and we have individuals and ladies who take an active role in the American Revolution. And then I'm left with the question: 
Why? Why does this matter? And uh, one, of course, is the typical answer people give, and I give it because it's real. And many of you are in this education, ma'am, heard that, and bringing the third graders and making them on fire. One of them is education. And my favorite quote, and I recommend this book to you because it's not a, it's not a history book, it's a history of philosophy of the revolution. Soon we shall know everything the 18th century did not know, and we will know nothing that it did, and it will be hard to live with us. See, they thought, think about that. Soon we will know everything they didn't know. We think we know it already. But we'll, we forget what they did know, and we certainly don't think like they thought. Powerful, powerful quote. The second answer to the why is more personal, and I got one more after this. My daughter joins the Navy out of nowhere trains to be a helicopter crew chief. She's been in three years. Back three years ago, she calls me, having grown up with a lawyer and watched people in jail and in court take oaths, you know, vows, remember those? And, um, and she says, Dad, Dad, I took the oath. And I pretended like I didn't know what it was. And she goes, like, well, what would you want? You know, to preserve and protect the law. Defend. 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 The cons what is it? Constitution. Okay, good. You want to make sure we got that right? And I praised her and I loved all over on the phone and all because, you know, they don't let you get near them anymore. But um, she said, she, I called her back a couple weeks later and said, honey, isn't that strange? They told you as a female in the Navy, she's only one of seven people out of 750 flying. And I'm proud of her, as you'd say. They told, they told her what bra she had to wear. And then they lied about it and sent that bra back. So it wasn't that bottom. But they never asked her to read the four pages of the Constitution. I didn't say interpret it, I didn't say talk about it like Charles would, I didn't say debate it. They never asked it. Now in law, and in my religion, we call that fraud. To take an oath to something you never read. I didn't even ask whether you understood it. And that's not politics, that's basic something. And then the last is better than I could say. And that is another book which you ought to read. If you, I know you've read it, but if you haven't read it recently, read it because it looks like it was written right now for this election called Common Sense. And in it, my favorite line by, Th uh, by Thomas Paine is, it may not always be that there is a body of reasonable men. Virtue is not hereditary. Virtue is not perpetual. We have every opportunity and every power before us to create, to, to create the most noble constitution on the face of the earth. And he meant here, these two places. We have it in our power to begin the world over again. 1776, Thomas Paine. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I want to say one brief thing. Uh, and I told you all, don't clap that much. <laughs> <laughs> Besides my friend who's in the middle of the room who su suffers from PAD, Project Angres Dysman Disorder, <laughs> <laughs> we, he finds, don't talk to Charles too long, but we find people who do things, and there's scholars in this room, and I mean, Dick, I'm picking on you, but your work is magnificent. But out of nowhere, and they're Yankees, came George and Carol, and, and I was with you 10 years ago, as you know, and they said, this is an idea, and this is what I'm going to do, and then they do what people don't do today. They do it. And not only do they do it, they stay with it. And they deserve not a clap. They deserve a revolutionary as well. Hip, hip! <laughs>